I'm can I start now? Yeah. <laughs> I'm here with Vidyar, co-writer and producer of Band-Aid and Live Aid, which raised money and awareness for the famine happening in Africa in 1984. I know the song, Do They Know It's Christmas? My parents play it all the time and have told me the story of it, but I want to hear it from you. How did you go from Bob Geldof watching a report on the TV on the famine in Africa to Band-Aid? Of all the people who Bob could have called, why you? That's a very good question, and I, I've asked myself that many, many times because, you know, Bob was uh, a very well-known musician, so right. he had lots of musical friends that he could have asked. And I think I just maybe happened to be in the right place at the right time, uh, honestly. Uh, his girlfriend, uh, who was going to become his wife eventually, uh, used to host a television show, okay. uh, a music show in the UK. And I was friends with Bob and Paula, his wife. Oh. And uh, Bob called Paula about something domestic. Uh, and I was doing a show. So he said, oh, she said, well, Midge is here. And he said, well, let me speak to Midge. And he started telling me about what he'd just seen on television, this, this, uh, this BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation's uh, footage of, about uh, a famine in Ethiopia. Now, this famine had been going on for two years. Wow. But it wasn't on the world news uh, because Ethiopia at the time was still a communist country. So it wasn't a big, uh, it wasn't big news. This was breaking news. So this famine was already way, way, way well developed. Definitely. Um, and Bob said, look, I, I, you know, I, I, my band isn't working right now. I, I'm a bit of a house husband. Uh, I want to do something. Will you help? Uh, so we met up a couple of days later and talked about what we could possibly do. And of course, the only thing that we're any good at, and even that's kind of doubtful, uh, is writing a song. You know, we're not, we're not capable of doing anything else. So we thought that if we wrote a song, a Christmas song it would have to be, to try and get it to number one in the charts in the right. UK over Christmas and New Year's and all of that stuff, we could maybe raise £100,000. That was, that was the entire plan. Right. That was it. And it did. Like, it went on the charts in the UK and it went so successful it was it was um even to to right to today uh it's the second biggest selling records that uh, has ever ever been made in the uk exactly so it and it, and it raised a little bit more than a hundred thousand pounds it raised uh seven million pounds so that's amazing so i write a lot about on my blog about using the power of your voice how did you think your voice could make a difference? And why did you do it? Sometimes it's kind of difficult for one person to be heard in a, in a, in a huge crowd of people. One voice in the world sometimes feels as though it's not making a difference. You can get two people saying the same thing. Right. Then you can double that and get four people, and right. get eight, and then get 16, and then get 32. All of a sudden you've got a huge amount of people all saying the same thing that's when it becomes powerful. So if it was just Bob and I uh, saying, no, this is dreadful, this famine's awful, you know, we want to do something about it. The first thing we did was use the power that we had. And the power we had as musicians, as well-known musicians, was that we knew lots of other well-known musicians. Right. So we got them involved. We got bigger artists than we were to come and help us. And when you had a crowd of people starting to say this, then other people joined in and more and more and more people joined in. So after Band-Aid, you know, we had, um, we had Northern Lights uh, here in Canada. We had uh, USA for Africa. We had a whole series of events that kind of happened. Uh, all these people all trying to make a difference, all for the same cause. And that's when it becomes incredibly powerful. If you can tell someone else about what's going on and get them to be on your side, then you start to become a bit of a powerful commodity. Right, and the idea spreads and then each musician added up to a big impact. That's right. And it be the song became very successful. Hugely successful, yeah. Exactly, and there have been many others who have followed um, Do They Know It's Christmas? In Canada, after the earthquake in Haiti in 2010, artists came together to re-record um, Canaan's Wave and Flag. And when I, when I talked to the president of the record label, I asked him, um, did any of the artists say no to recording their song? And he said 
no is a request for more information. And what made, what made people say yes to Band-Aid? I think, um, I think by the time uh, Bob had spoken to me about it, by the time we had decided that the, the thing to do was to make a record, to call yeah. this thing Band-Aid, everybody had seen the, the hideous footage on television, you know, these, the, the scenes of devastation, these kind of biblical uh, scenes of, of, kind of mass uh, misery. Uh, so we were all very aware of what it was about. There wasn't one person who turned up to do Band Aid or Live Aid who didn't know why they were doing it. And sometimes you find that, that artists uh, can, can go along to these events because the manager said go along because it's good for your career. Right. Or the record company have said, oh, you should be there because it's going to be a really cool thing to do. Everyone, without exception, knew exactly why they were there. Right. And they were all there for the right reasons and the right cause. So we didn't really have anyone saying no, they, they, they couldn't or wouldn't come. Um, and even when it came on to uh, doing Live Aid, which was six months after Band Aid, uh, which was the big global concert, right. um, you know, it was difficult, again, it was kind of difficult to try and pin everyone down because musicians are very busy. Of course. But once we said what it was, it was an extension of Band Aid, they all came. Exactly, because it was just sort of a sequel to Band-Aid, and they all knew about Band-Aid, and they wanted to do something about it, and they Absolutely. wanted to act. Yeah, and it's not as though the famine had gone away, right. you know, although it was six months later. What, what really happened was that um, uh, the first piece of information we ever got, the first bit of advice we got mm -hmm. from anyone about doing Band-Aid, was from the musician uh, George Harrison, who, oh. who was one of the Beatles. And George had done a concert uh, a few years before for uh, the people of Bangladesh. And, uh, and all the money kind of disappeared. It didn't go where it was meant to go. And it wasn't George didn't take it, it just disappeared. And he said to us, get yourself good accountants, form a trust of people, the Band-Aid Trust, a body right. of people who will oversee where all this money goes and, uh, and make sure that all, uh, it's all above board. Well, you'd think that seven million pounds was a lot of money. It's not really a lot of money. But we went through that seven million pounds very, very quickly with all the emergency food that we had to send out, the medication, the trucking, you know, all of that stuff. Uh, and we realized that we needed to generate more. Right. And if we wanted to generate more, we had to make something big, a big statement. Exactly. The big statement was Live Aid. And that's awesome. Totally awesome. <laughs> so you're just as passionate about Africa today as you were 30 years ago. What are the biggest challenges and how can people help Africa now? Well, you know, Africa doesn't, it, it doesn't really change. It's um, hence calling it Band-Aid. You know, Band-Aid is a little sticking plaster, isn't it? And that's, right. that's what yeah. you do, you put it over a cut. Exactly. But, but Africa has a lot more than just a cut. You know, it's it's got real problems. So a band-aid will fix a little a little thing, but not the huge you know, the, the overall uh, problem. So Africa's an ongoing situation, um, um, and, and what we've seen, what I've seen, having been there quite a few times, is the first time I went to uh, to Africa was with uh, just a, just after band-aid, and I went with the emergency goods that we sent out um, because if I didn't go or Bob didn't go and the cameras didn't go, therefore the people at home didn't see exactly. what was going on. So I went there and it was hideous. I, I wouldn't even go into how horrible it was, but I wasn't the type of person who could go and face that situation. Right. Um, but having been back quite a few times since, I can see the difference that's going on within Africa. The changes that have been made because of things like Band-Aid and Northern Lights and Live Aid and all of that stuff. Um, so it's changing very, very slowly, but it's such a huge country. The continent is massive, it's absolutely huge. And it takes a long time to fix things like that. But things are in place, so there's a, there's a, it's an ongoing situation. People can help by just being aware. Just be aware of what's actually going on out there in the world. It's, uh, there's, a, there's a statistic that says something like, and this is probably completely wrong, that only one person in three in America has a passport, wow. which means that they don't really travel. 
And when you travel around the world, and especially in America, which is again a huge country, uh, you find that people don't really watch what's going on. A lot of people don't see what's going on in the outside world. Exactly. Here in Canada, you're much more like the British. We we see the world news. We see what's going on mm -hmm. uh, in the in the Far East. We see what's going on with the, the uh, you know the, the typhoons, and we see what's going on with the, the, the you know in, in the world, and we're exposed to it. And uh, and you guys you guys are as well. So when you see something that affects you, do something about it. You know, stand up and. Let your voice be heard, you know. If that means just putting your hand in your pocket and donating some money towards a cause, that's great. If you can actually physically do something about it, you know, get a group of friends together, raise some money, uh, you know, do something proactive, then it's, it's an even better thing to do, isn't it? Yeah, and use your voice. Get your voices heard, and it's, it's a really difficult thing to do sometimes. But if you get little groups of people all doing it, all talking about the same problem, then all of a sudden you've got a mass of people. You've got a football stadium full of people. Then you've got politicians watching what's going on, thinking, oh, hold on a second, what are these guys doing? And you get the voice of the politicians on board. I don't think there's a politician on the planet who wasn't around when Band Aid and Live Aid happened, who no, wasn't course. directly affected by what went on then. So those guys are in positions of power. They're the ones who need to be reminded why Band Aid happened, why Live Aid happened, you know, why events like that have happened. Um, because the media is a very powerful tool. And these guys, you know, we can force them into doing things. We can embarrass them into doing it by saying, ah, hold on a second, you said you would make a change, you know. So if they don't make the change, it's up to you when you're old enough to vote for exactly. the people that you think uh, are doing the right job. Yeah, and so like now, young people can change the world and they can still like, even like you said, you know, just spread awareness. Awareness is incredibly important, you know, and uh, it's so easy for, especially for young people to be distracted from what's going on in the world, you know, right. they're playing games or on the phones or texting or all of that stuff, you know. But getting people your age involved in causes is incredibly important because you guys, you can change the world. You, it's, it, it, you have the power in your hands to do it. It's your world, you know, we've kind of done our bit and are still doing it, but that message has been passed down. And it's just so great to see someone like yourself sitting here worrying about this stuff and, and wanting to do something about it, wanting to make that change. Thank you, and um, I heard that you were on Celebrity Cooking and <laughs> you did really good on it. So now we're gonna try rapid fire questions and answers. Oh. I'm gonna ask you questions about food you're going to answer as quick as, as you can. Okay, see, I knew there was something coming, okay. <laughs> so, number one, what is your perfect meal? Perfect meal is uh, sitting with a bunch of friends and I spend all day making uh, an Asian fusion meal. Oh, that's interesting. What do you make that's better than anyone else? Uh, I make a mess better than anyone else. Uh, the, the kitchen after I'm finished and it's like someone's kind of dropped a bomb on it. It's not pretty. Okay. Um, what's your favorite thing that, um, that you eat and that you ate but um, that you didn't make though? Favorite thing I've eaten but I didn't make? Oh, there's so much. When you travel uh, as much as I do around the right. world, you get to try little bits and pieces. So I still, I still love, um, I still love uh, Japanese food, and I still haven't quite conquered how to get it to taste authentic. So that's still a <laughs> hidden secret to me. Um, if you were going to be given an award um, uh, for a meal, what would it be? An award for a meal? Oh, um, I would think uh, the best ever uh, Scottish <laughs> porridge. Uh, making Ooh. award. Now that would be good. Better try that someday. <laughs> if I was coming to your house for dinner, um, what would you make? I have celiac and I'm gluten free, so you know, have to be gluten free. Whoa, that's tricky. Gluten free. Um, so um, my my wife doesn't eat. Uh, she she tries to avoid uh, wheat and, oh, really? and flour. Yeah. Uh, so we tend to go for uh, lots of vegetables. Uh, we uh, we I I love I. I it's probably very uncool to say it. I love vegetables, so uh, oh. so I'm quite happy sitting with a you know a piece of chicken and a, a piece of fish and a whole selection of vegetables. 
Awesome. Thank you so much for your time and what you do. It's uh, it's amazing for what you do. It's not nearly as amazing as what you're doing. Believe Thank me. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. And I'm here with Vidyar. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm here with Hannah. <laughs>